from the headquarters of Telesur English in Quito, Ecuador. This is from the south, and I'm Jose Daniel Lopez. This Sunday, Cubans head to the polls to vote in their constitutional referendum. Profound changes in Cuban society, new economic policies, and shifting international context were all factors that led Cuban leaders to think of changing the constitution. Earlier, I was able to speak to author and journalist Arnold August from Montreal, Canada, for some insight into Cuba's constitutional reform. Let's have a look. Now, can you tell us a bit more about the massive participation within the consultation process over the last several months? I think that uh, the, the consultation process is one of the main features of the entire political process that's been going on for a couple of years. In fact, the, uh, in last July, the National Assembly, or Cuba's parliament, after much debate amongst the elected deputies, worked out a draft of the Constitution in July. And it was decided that the draft Constitution be presented to the people all across the country, in workplaces, in neighborhoods, in educational centers, everywhere, for a three-month period. That is, it took place from mid-August till mid-November, so that people could have their input with regards to the Constitution. And this, I was actually in Cuba at the time when this consultation was taking place. And in a nutshell, I would say that despite the uh, stereotypes regarding Cuba, that's a closed society, there's no discussion, people are afraid to talk, the, it's actually the opposite. I have never seen such lively debate and discussion amongst the Cuban people at the base, amongst journalists, intellectuals, on television, etc., regarding key points on the Constitution. Let us be clear, when the Constitution was presented and adopted in July of Sorry, last summer, many people, right from the start, were not in agreement with all of the points of the Constitution. And that, thus, this provoked a very lively debate amongst the people with regards to certain articles in that constitution. That consultation took place from mid-August till mid-November. And then in the last few months, the National Assembly had the responsibility of collecting the literally hundreds and thousands of opinions of individual citizens in order to work a, a new draft constitution, which was just adopted very recently. And it is being uh, presented to the people for on a referendum to take place today and throughout Cuba. Arnold also discussed the media frenzy over whether communism will remain in the constitution. When the draft constitution was, uh, was uh, released in last July and the word communi communism was deleted, this created a euphoria um, in the North amongst journalists, amongst Cuba experts and all that. Ah, Cuba has given up communism. Now, what I like about this whole debate is that I secretly was very happy that they deleted the word communism because then the ball was in the hands of the Cuban people to put the term communism back into that constitution. So we have a situation where the opposite, what is portrayed in Cuba, that communism is or the ideas of communism are imposed uh, by the, on the top, by the leaders on the Cuban people. But what happened here is very interesting. It's almost a historical uh, event uh, of great importance, I believe, is that the Cuban people themselves say, no, we don't agree with taking out the word communism. Let's put communism into the Constitution, even though we know that it is a long-term ideal that we were we are looking for so you actually had the people imposing communism on the constitution and on the, uh, the cuban system there are various other aspects but i thought in my view coming you know from the north and where the whole issue of socialism and communism is very much debated i thought that was really a very important point in terms of the debate uh, amongst the people and the results our guest arnold august also spoke about the yes i know referendum campaign over the past couple of days 
Now we have seen a lot of support from the yes vote, but what is behind the no campaigning and why they are against the passing of this new constitution? Well, the, 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 uh, of course, the no vote, uh, what, there, there are different tendencies. I guess you would say the main official tendency, that is, uh, documents show that it's basically led by the United States, by Washington, with the sign, uh, you'll vote no, uh, I am voting no, is basically that it does not say, it says that the Cuban people should not give their okay to the same Cuban socialist system with the goal of communism, uh, the same socialist uh, Cuban political system, which believes in the one-party state, so-called one-party state, and not, not the U.S. model of a multi-party system, et cetera, et cetera. The basic goal is uh, orientation is saying no, because we do not want the Cuban people to continue with their own path towards socialism and their own political system, their own economic system. That's basically the same. That's what, that's the overall orientation. But I think perhaps we could discuss this later on today because it, it's a very complicated situation where you also have people who are not officially U.S. spokesperson, but they are actually carrying out, in my view, a very dangerous campaign. I would say like a centrist campaign not for the yes and not for the no. But the overall orientation of the centrist opportunist campaign is to encourage the no vote. In fact, I was reading the newspapers uh, yesterday in preparation for the interview today uh, from uh, Miami Herald, CNN, Reuters, etc. And they basically quote some people, even one or two from Cuba, who are saying that the, the uh, Cubans are going to abstain massively in the vote today, that they will not vote, or many people will vote against the Constitution. I think they're reading the situation wrongly, but I guess we'll have to see later on today for the results. It's a very, there's a lot of pressure on the Cuban social system, on the government, and on the people coming from uh, different quarters. The official no vote, as well as the, what I would call the centrist vote, the centrist no vote within the system and even within Cuba itself. The constitutional reform in Cuba, approved by the National Assembly, has been debated for three months in communities and workshops. In this report, we'll learn more about the process that Cubans started last August. In this research center for livestock improvement, the island's constitutional reform is being debated. Very important. This is very important because we're making out the path we must go take. And in this particular case, we're looking forward to contributing to our country's development. Scientists leave the laboratories for a few minutes to join the debate with their colleagues. Several topics are being discussed. One of them is same-sex marriage. God created man and woman so they can procreate. And I think that was no mistake. That's why I think that it would be a big mistake to approve same-sex marriage. We won't be able to go back. For others, same-sex marriage follows the humanist goal of the Cuban Revolution. I don't think that we should do what the rest of the world does. This is about a constitution, and we are going to be able to hear what every citizen has to say. As each citizen will have the opportunity to vote for the constitution. We are defending a human right. It's not only from a historic or religious point of view, about giving citizens the opportunity to understand other citizens. Participants of the referendum's first round agree that the debate is a democratic expression of their country. For us, being part of the constitutional reform debate alone is already important. The other important thing is to apply what our constitution says. The first constitutional reform debate was done last August on Fidel Castro's 92nd birthday. For many, the Magna Carta that includes their political thinking is also a homage to the leader of the Cuban Revolution. Venezuela's President Nicolás Maduro addressed the crowds marching in Caracas on Saturday in support of the country's sovereignty. President Maduro denounced what he called the opposition's provocations on the border. He also broke off diplomatic ties with the government of Colombia. 
I cannot continue. I cannot continue withstanding this. We cannot continue withstanding the territory of Colombia is given for an attack against Colombia. That's why I've decided to break all political and diplomatic relationships with the fascist government of Colombia and all their ambassadors and all the consuls who must leave in 24 hours time of Venezuela. Out of here, oligarchy. Out of here. Get out of here. Enough is enough. Maduro was speaking to a demonstration in support of the Bolivarian Revolution. They demanded respect for Venezuela's sovereignty and condemned the attempts to intervene in the country. They say they will defend the gains of the last two decades. I'm a member of the People's Militia and a teacher at the Bolivarian University. And what we want is to defend our revolution and the changes that this country has seen, which have been absolutely fundamental for the last 20 years. The National Red Cross says it has learned people not affiliated with the organization have been seen wearing the Red Cross emblem at the Colombia-Venezuela border and the Brazil-Venezuela border. This is footage from the scene of the fire at the Santander Bridge in Ureña. At least two different individuals were seen what looks like the Red Cross emblem. In a tweet, the organization urged them to stop and say this kind of act jeopardizes the neutrality and impartiality of the Red Cross. And Venezuela's Foreign Minister Jorge Arriaza pointed out that the International Red Cross and UN agencies are now participated in the border show. He tweeted that there's a simple reason for this, saying, quote, it is obviously an action with political objectives that could never be described as a humanitarian action. And a warm welcome for Bolivarian National Guard troops. Residents cheer and thank them on the Tienditas Bridge after they spend the day defending the sovereignty of Venezuela at the border with Colombia. And just two small truckloads of aid remain on the Brazilian side of the border. Things were relatively calm, but not normal, in the Brazilian border town of Paracayama, at the Venezuelan town of Santa Elena de Uairen. Demonstrations against intervention in Venezuela have been taking place around the world. In London, protesters condemned the interference pushed by the government, describing the action as despicable. The demonstration took place outside the Bank of England, which is refusing to hand over more than a billion dollars worth of Venezuela's gold reserves. The former mayor of London, Ken Livingstone, was at the protest. Because all my life, America's governments have tried to overthrow regimes they don't like. And whilst American governments say, oh, we're defending democracy, no, almost all those governments have been democratically elected or have come to power overthrowing an evil right-wing dictatorship. America's interventions are just so they can continue to extract the wealth of that nation. In New York City, hands off Venezuela protesters demonstrated in Sukoti Park before staging a protest inside Oculus where they chanted no more war. Boston former Green Party presidential candidate Dr. Jill Stein spoke at the Hands Off Venezuelan rally. It's not easy to stop a war machine as it's revving up to pounce, and we all know that it is, but there's one thing that can stop it. That's us by saying, hell no, keep your hands off Venezuela. Before this is over, we're going to need to stand up we're going to need to sit in, we're going to need to lock down, we're going to need to do what it takes in order to stop this empire from crushing half the world around us and more. More stories coming up, we'll be back in a minute.
Welcome back. Now for the latest on the situation at Venezuela's border, we're joined live from Ureña by Alejandro Kirk, journalist and correspondent from Hispan TV. Hello, Alejandro. Thank you so much for joining us. Hello. How are you doing? You um, update us on the current here situation there. Where everything took place yesterday. You ask me what, what you want to know and I will reply. Can you give us an update of the situation there? Well, uh, you know, this is the, the bridge, Francisco de Paula Santander, between Escobal in uh, Colombia and Ureña on the Venezuelan side. What happened yesterday had nothing, has nothing, had nothing to do with what we're seeing today. Today, Colombian authorities have taken over this place. Yesterday, this was controlled by the uh, supporters of uh, Guaido, the, the, the self-proclaimed president of Venezuela, and were trying to take over not just the bridge, but break through with the trucks in order to deliver the so-called humanitarian aid over to the Venezuelan side. That did not happen. But an incident took place, which is very important as an incident, because two trucks were um, burnt and another truck was uh, sacked. Uh, what happened here is that, you know, according to Venezuelan authorities, what, what happened here was that the, the, uh, an attempt to create a casus belli, a provocation, in order to attack Venezuela militarily. Um, I, I must say that, you know, the group of policemen, uh, the National uh, Bolivarian Police from Venezuela, were uh, over 12 hours resisting this attack, and they were su successful. In other words, the, the, the humanitarian aid that was supposed to go through, it didn't, didn't go. And um, in that sense, I, I would say that the Venezuelan side won. Today, you know, there is a, a, a proof of that. The, uh, the, the bridge, as you can see, the, the police is taking over. The authorities are uh, uh, preventing everybody to come over the place. Uh, the Venezuelan government broke relations yesterday, so the, the situation is still very tense. Uh, and it seems that normality has been restored. And what are the expectations for today? Well, the, 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 there will be no more violence today, at least. Uh, yesterday, it, it was the big day. You know, the, op the Venezuelan opposition always tries to uh, set some deadlines in which everything will happen, uh, miracles. Everything will change uh, miraculously in one day with one single event. Yesterday, the event was that three bridges over here uh, were supposed to uh, uh, allow this uh, uh, humanitarian aid to go through and with then the, the, the uh, avalanche of uh, humanitarian people who would go over and destabilize the country. The idea was the armed forces and especially the uh, um, National Guard uh, in Venezuela would break up and uh, uh, allow this uh, aid to go through. You know, for the entire day, at least in the morning yesterday, in all three bridges, um, the Colombian police allowed people to go through and get to uh, get in touch with the Venezuelan police, which was protecting the Venezuelan side of the bridge. In that process, they, these people were trying to convince the Venezuelan soldiers to uh, turn sides, let them go through. They appealed to their mothers, their children, their family, and even with threats of international uh, court to be uh, tried, uh, they, they, they would, you know, presenting a, a very obscure future for them if they didn't allow them to go through. That didn't work. Some, a few of uh, um, Venezuelan police and National Guard people came over, three or four lower rank uh, officers, but as a whole, they were able to resist and, and su successfully. So that didn't work, and, he, and, and, he, and he, like in many other occasions with the Venezuelan opposition, when this thing that was promised to them, you know, today it was the big day, yesterday, I mean, and it didn't happen. When it didn't happen, uh, they get down. The, the, there is a depression that takes over, the, over them, and they don't act anymore. And this is what's happening here. There is a few people around trying to get to the bridge, but not, not more than 20 of them. And yesterday we had here hundreds 
of what they called Guarimberos trying to um, go over to the Venezuelan side. There is a big discussion about who burnt the, the, these trucks. Um, sorry, sorry to uh, Most right. likely, according to our view of the situation, uh, it, was the, it was the Venezuelan oppo opposition people. Yes. Sorry to interrupt, but we're running out of time. Thank you so hear. much for joining us, actually, and sharing the information with us today. Uh, so, sorry, I didn't hear that. I said that we thank you for joining us. We're taking one last break, but stay with us. We are present at every event of what our nations are staring. We believe in a new global vision, united in every broadcasting. We keep expanding our horizons and working on a closer and better communication. Now, in Grenada, Telesur, the new source from South America and the Caribbean. Welcome back. Votes are still being counted in Nigeria's presidential election. The Independent Electoral Commission said the results are expected to be in by Tuesday. Election day there was generally being described as peaceful despite an attack in the country's north and delays at some polling stations. Syrian Democratic Forces have supervised the movement of men, women and children out of the last redoubt of the Islamic State group in eastern Syria. This video of a truck carrying civilians out of the holdout, the Islamic State has been accused of using civilians as shields against attacks. And the, Demo and the Syrian Democratic Forces said they will not continue fighting in the area if civilians were still inside. At the moment, we are evacuating civilians who have surrendered to the Syrian Democratic Forces. Their number is high, at least 2,000 people. Another part is waiting for the vehicles to come out. Two people are dead and one injured after a minibus hit a landmine while crossing the border between Ukraine and the breakaway Donetsk region. The bus hit the mine after swerving off road in the buffer zone between two border posts near the village of Yelenovga outside Donetsk. The passengers were returning to the rebel control region after collecting their pensions. The landmine explosion happened as a result of the driver's negligence because the landmine was located on the roadside. There are signs warning of landmines at certain distances everywhere here. It appears as though the driver wanted to overtake the line, drove over the landmine and it exploded. Pope Francis on Saturday prayed for the sexual abuse victims and asked members of the clergy to took a, to their actions during the penitential prayer service. The pontiff's words came on the penultimate date of a four-day Vatican conference of senior church officials. The sexual abuse crisis has made 2018 one of the toughest years for the Pope since his election in 2013. And with this story, we come to the end of this news brief. You can find these and many other stories in our website at telesurenglish.net. And don't forget to follow us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For Telesur English, I'm Jose Daniel Lopez. Thank you for watching.